So I ran a poll yesterday, and you all wanted to hear about hard takeoff. And so I followed that rabbit hole, and it led to some unexpected ideas, most of the ideas you've probably heard before. But let's dive right in. Oh, and also I'll address the elephant in the room. Uh, faceless day because, well, I just don't feel pretty today. So moving on. So when we say hard takeoff, what exactly do we mean? Um, you know, kind of the the primary idea is that we're going to have a data flywheel where AI makes more AI and the AI helps with the research and makes more data. And then, you know, GPT-5 gives rise to GPT-6 and that only takes a few months. And then GPT-6 gives rise to GPT-7 and that only takes a few weeks and so on and so forth. So that's basically the kind of the exponential uh, takeoff. Now, that's looking at just the mathematical uh, aspects of GPT itself. Parameter count goes up, algorithmic improvements go up, amount of training data goes up, those sorts of things. Uh, now, but what you also have to keep in mind is that hard takeoff will also have a pretty profound impact on uh, the rest of society. And so you have these ripple effects, these knock-on effects where, you know, we're already seeing People like hotly debating, is Claude 3 AGI? Is it sentient? Um, and so each of those changes uh, in terms of our epistemic and ontological and philosophical orientation, that's one way that the ripple effects will just you know send shockwaves around society on top of the actual practical impacts. So, you know, GPT-4, not necessarily the best at running agents and replacing jobs. It's already happening out there but it could be happening faster. GPT-5 almost certainly will be a bigger job destroyer. GPT-6, so on and so forth, Claude-4, uh, you know, Sora-2, all of these models that are coming, they're going to change things. And the faster those models come, the more of a compelling case they have at just disrupting everything that we think we know about science, about math, about economics, and even society itself, just the, in the same way that the internet really has kind of fundamentally disrupted uh, the way that human society works. And so you might say, okay, well, what are, what's, like, what are the breaks? And as I was making this slide deck, I realized like I had a couple, a couple of slides in here about like, oh, we could break in this way and this might also serve as breaks. But basically there are no breaks. And I'll talk about this in the next slide when I talk about race dynamics. But you know, just for the sake of argument, there are no breaks that we can consciously put on. However, there are going to be uh, bottlenecks, some natural constraints, and these are the five kind of natural constraints that I came up with. So one, energy consumption. As we all already know, GPT-4, you know, like I think it's like every time you interact with chat GPT, it uses like, I don't know, 20 liters of water worth of cooling or something like that. Um, and that's only going to go up as things get more and more uh, saturated and, and more models get deployed. So energy consumption is going to be a major constraint. And this is why, you know, everyone from Sam Altman to Microsoft are investing in uh, renewable energy like solar farms. Microsoft has started putting data centers underwater, like out in the ocean and maybe at the bottom of lakes. I don't know. Just to have that, that natural ambient cooling. Um, but, you know, solar fusion, uh, you know, ocean-based cooling, like these are very energy intense uh, pursuits. And so that's going to be one natural constraint. Um, semiconductors, so chips. This is why you see, you know, Sam Altman trying to invest in chips. This is why you see NVIDIA turning up the heat. Now one of the most valuable companies on the planet. I think it tripled its stock price last year, something along those lines. Oh, and by the way, I called it. Uh, this time last year, I was saying that NVIDIA was the underdog because I had been in private talks with NVIDIA. Um, I was basically in their beta program. It wasn't like, you know, I wasn't going to do anything crazy. I was just one of the first people to use Nemo. Um, and that's all like public knowledge now. Anyways, I knew that they they had more than they were letting on. Um, and I don't mean like secrets, but, but what I mean is market potential. Um, so NVIDIA now, they are, you know, they're, they're the new kid on the block. And then there's uh, like Grok. So like the G-R-O-Q that uh, Anastasia and Tech covered. And, you know, there's photonic chips coming. There's all kinds of other things. But still, like, this is going to be one of the biggest natural constraints. And as a lot of people have talked about in the past, uh, you know, this was in the the emails that OpenAI published. The The science of, of neural networks hasn't fundamentally changed in 30 or 40 years. Now, what I will say, because some people ask me about that, is there were some very profound algorithmic breakthroughs, particularly around loss functions and reverse propagation. 
But again, those like, okay, so we, we improved the math, but it wasn't fundamentally new math. Um, so the biggest constraint has been hardware. So hardware is going to be a constraint. Energy is going to be a constraint. Data quality, as we've heard over the last six months, a lot of companies like OpenAI are basically running out of data. They've trained it on the entire internet. And this is one of the reasons that I thought Google was going to overtake OpenAI. But it turns out that Google, it appears Google is kind of ossified. And there were actually calls for the CEO to step down because he was overseeing kind of more of a, an established company. And so whether or not Google can actually pivot to compete with Microsoft and OpenAI remains to be seen. However, they have their TPUs and they have the data. So the only limitation is going to be human limitations there. Um, but again, broadly speaking, as we're training models, basically on all available data on humanity, like uh, we've also seen that like data is not created equal. You need high quality data and a lot of it. Um, and so this is, this will actually figure later into the video. So keep that in mind. Quality and quantity of data is huge. Now, also, there's the question of algorithmic breakthroughs. A lot of people are saying, you know, LLMs won't take us to AGI, and some people will question whether or not transformers even can. Um, but then I think that those discussions are going to go away, particularly as we see transformers used, one, in multimodal uh, situations, audio, video, text, um, embodiment data, and those other kinds of things. But then also, I think that uh, I think that as the as transformers, as we see that this architecture can basically do anything with any kind of data, um, we're going to also realize that uh, the path to AGI were much closer than we realize. And yes, there will probably be some really fundamental um, algorithmic breakthroughs in the future. But you know, as Demis Sasabis and others have said, we're nowhere near the maximum capacity of transformer architecture. So this might actually not be as much of a bottleneck as some people once thought. No language on its own probably won't get us to AGI, but the transformer architecture almost certainly can, in my personal opinion. And then the, the, the biggest constraint actually might be diminishing returns. Um, there might be natural limitations to maximal intelligence. And so what I, call, what I call this, and I've talked about it in older videos, is the intelligence optimum. And so when I talk about diminishing returns, what I'm referring to is, yes, you can make something that is bigger and smarter and faster, and it can calculate, you know, like uh, the, the world brain from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But as they said in Oppenheimer, uh, theory will only take you so far. Eventually, you need to war interact with the real world um, because no amount of math can actually fully and accurately model the real world. Yes, math is the language of the universe, but our math is far from perfect. And so simulation and like, so I was asked in a, in a podcast interview recently that'll go live in the next week or so, um, like why wouldn't AI just build, you know, computronium in the light cone? I was like, because there is diminishing returns to having more compute. Eventually you need to make measurements. So in science, particularly in the hard sciences, there's this dichotomy be between modeling or calculating and experiments or measuring. And so you can calculate what the result is, but eventually you're just going to need to measure. And so again, having the biggest brain in the universe doesn't really matter if you don't have any out inputs from the outside world. So that's going to be one of the big bottlenecks. Now, however, those are the primary constraints that I could identify. Um, humans are not going to put on the brakes. Compounding returns, though, this is the virtuous cycle that we're all kind of looking at, particularly as uh, you know, more universities uh, come in, uh, governments invest, militaries invest, corporations invest. So you get this, you get this flywheel effect. So for those of you not in the technology sector, there's this concept called a data flywheel, which is basically the better your product is, the more data you get, which makes your AI better, which then makes your products even more compelling and useful, which means that you get even more data and so on and so forth. And data is the new oil. And so the compounding returns around AI basically focus on this data flywheel effect. I, some of my Patreons and other supporters asked about this as well. And I said, look, we haven't, you haven't seen anything yet. Once we have these transformers working in embodied chassis, like out in the real world with hands and eyes and cameras, that is going to set the data flywheel like up to 30,000 RPM. Right now, the data flywheel for AI is on idle, right? It's like a diesel engine that's just turning over at about 600 RPM. You guys haven't seen anything yet. By the end of this year, you're really going to be hearing more about the data flywheel that happens 
particularly as more and more models are put into robots, whether it's self-driving cars, whether it's humanoid robots, so on and so forth, because each of those robots is going to be also a source of really good data. Now, I know that Elon Musk said the same thing about Tesla, but, you know, honestly, what Tesla didn't have was transformer architecture. They were a little bit too early to the game, in my opinion, and they also didn't understand enough about uh, about cognitive architecture. Um, but solving all the problems that they are with Optimus, I think, will actually probably contribute to uh, full self-driving cars. And what they didn't realize is that to be a fully self-driving car, you need to have human level intelligence and human level abstract thought. It's not just, you know, getting an NPC controller from A to B. Um, kind of like, you know, you might think like, well, hey, cars can drive around well enough in, you know, Grand Theft Auto or Cyberpunk or whatever. Why can't they drive well enough, you know, in, in the real world? And there's a lot of reasons for that, but really what you need is a full cognitive architecture. Now, these compounding returns are going to apply to places other than just AI. So we're seeing, uh, you know, AI is helping with quantum computing, it's helping with fusion, it's helping with material science. And as it makes those fields better, those fields will also contribute back to making AI better and faster by creating more energy, by creating better uh, GPUs and those sorts of things. And so that is another part of the virtuous cycle or that data flywheel. That's not part of the data flywheel itself picking up speed, but that is part of the virtuous cycle. And so we have these multiple compounding returns. You have the data flywheel effect. You have these knock-on effects in parallel fields that are all going to make AI go faster and faster. And then we have uh, saltatory leaps. So basically the primary difference between hard takeoff and soft takeoff is what's called gradualistic changes, which is like battery technology. So batteries have been around for, I think, more than 100 years now, at least in, in, in a modern form factor that you'd recommend or recognize. And so like you go back to like World War I, you know, people had battery powered flashlights. The battery sucked compared to today, um, but they've gradually improved over the last century. Battery chemistry has gotten better. Battery construction has gotten better. Some of the first automobiles were battery powered. Um, I don't know if you remember that. Well, nobody alive remembers that. Um, but you can go look it up. Some of the some of the very first automobiles were battery powered. Then we went to internal combustion engines just because the energy density was better. And so battery technology is a perfect example of a gradualistic uh, technological progress. But a saltatory leap, this is when you go from zero to one. And so when you go from zero to one, you create fundamentally new capabilities. And so the reason that I, that I have this here is imagine the invention of warp drive. If you go from chemical rockets, which have sub-relativistic acceleration, right? You go from zero to you know, 25,000 miles an hour after you expend millions and millions of pounds of rocket fuel. This is why it's like, okay, SpaceX is cool because you can land the rockets, but it's not a fundamentally new technology. We've had rocket technology, um, as you'd recognize it today, for almost 100 years. Now, obviously, the Chinese invented um, solid fuel rockets for fireworks like, I don't know, 1,500 years ago. Uh, but anyways, rockets, you know, chemical-based rockets, nothing new. But imagine that, su that suddenly, you know, Zephyr and Cochran um, out in Colorado invents warp drive in the next couple decades. And now you have the ability to not just go to 20,000 miles an hour. You have the ability to accelerate to relativistic speeds. That is an example of a saltatory leap, which is where you go from you know, the current paradigm to an entirely new paradigm. And this is kind of what we're talking about with hard takeoff. So hard takeoff would be, okay, you know, there's some other algorithmic breakthrough, maybe, you know, something that Claude 4 can do or GPT-5 can do or some, you know, some of these other models that just says, okay, this new capability fundamentally changes our approach to computation. It fundamentally changes the abilities of AI. And honestly, when I first got my hands on GPT-2 and GPT-3, that was a saltatory leap. It offered an entirely new kind of computing. So we've already seen one saltatory leap, but its utility was still relatively low. And so what I mean by that is that, yes, GPT-2 was a new way of doing some basic NLP tasks, you know, punctuation uh, correction, um, you know, detecting sentence boundaries, those sorts of things. It was a fundamentally new approach, but it didn't really move the needle that much. Then GPT-3 and GPT-4 come along, and now people are really seeing, oh, this is a fundamentally new way of doing business. It's not just a new way of com computing. It is a fundamentally new way of doing business. Now, that was one saltatory leap that has been that has since had some gradualistic progress. 
However, the compounding returns from AI and all these other effect, all these other knock-on effects could create more saltatory leaps. So here's an example. I don't know if this is actually going to happen, but an example could be, oh, hey, GPT-5 helps us invent you know, graphene-based transistors, which then take, you know, breaks Moore's law and suddenly the next generation of, of GPUs are a thousand times more powerful um, and more energy efficient, or it helps us figure out quantum computing. So the, the rollout of quantum computing is ap- absolutely going to be a saltatory leap um, if it pans out. Now, obviously, quantum computing hasn't really moved the needle yet. Quantum computing looks like it's kind of at the GPT-2 phase where we have a functional proof of concept, but it hasn't really changed the way that we're doing business. Nuclear fusion would be another saltatory leap just because of the uh, energy hyperabundance that it would it would create compared to our energy availability today. And so all of these saltatory leaps, they catalyze permanent and inevitable changes to society. In the same way that that the invention of electricity, internal combustion engines, and internet catalyzed uh, fundamental changes in society, in politics and economics, and also geopolitics, it changed the, the, the world order. Um, this is what I mean by saltatory leaps. So be on the lookout for some of those saltatory leaps. Quantum computing and nuclear fusion are probably the biggest predictable ones um, out there. There might still be more saltatory leaps in the AI field, but also because of the the breakthroughs of transformers, we might have already seen the saltatory leap, and now AI technology is going to advance gradualistically. We don't know. Okay, so as promised, this is the kind of the reason why there's no breaks. All gas, no breaks. The last time we had kind of an arms race was around nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are only useful for destruction. They are only they strategically they only serve as a deterrent, and their only instrumental purpose is to wipe out cities. Now AI is not like that. Now I know that people have compared AI to nuclear weapons, saying that oh it's 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 even more dangerous because it has a mind of its own. And yes, intelligence is intrinsically dangerous. Um, the smarter you are, the more destructive you can be. Some of the most destructive people in history were also very high IQ. Uh, So that is just like, we just got to address that elephant in the room. However, AI also has many, many, many instrumental purposes other than destructive uses. It can help cure diseases. It can help run cities. It can help make your life better. It can be entertaining. And so because it has all of these positive utilities, um, it's not going to make sense for everyone to regulate it out of existence in the same way that, you know, mutually assured destruction, uh, non nonproliferation agreements in the nuclear space. And yes, nuclear is dual use because you can make nuclear reactors, but there's enough difference between nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons that you can kind of differentiate those technologies today. But AI is just the better AI you have, the more advantages you have. Um, both in terms of geopolitical advantages, in terms of economic advantages. And so because of this, because everyone on the board, uh, so like imagine that you're playing an RPG, or not an RPG, a grand strategy game like Rome Total War or Civilization or whatever, and suddenly every player on the map gets a pop-up, oh, hey, you have a new research tree. And then you look at the research tree and it's like stage one, you know, you get a 10% economic boost. Stage two, you get a 50% economic boost. Um, and you also get military advantages. And then when you get to research stage three, you basically win the game. Um, nobody is incentivized to slow down. There are literally zero incentives to slow down except the possibility the specter of AI becoming dangerous. And so in the podcast interview that I've, that I've alluded to, I called that a prophecy. It is a prophecy when someone says, AI will kill everyone. That is a prediction. And yes, it is rooted in some data, some information, some models, but it is, a, it is an affirmative prediction of what will happen. And there's no guarantee that it's going to happen. So you can say, all right, well, the only reason to slow down is this prophecy that AI will kill everyone, which is not a guarantee. And you, you, it's debatable as to whether or not it's even likely to happen. Uh, and so, because there's that room for that room for debate, that that room for misunderstanding, this is why we enter into these race dynamics, or what I call the terminal race condition, which is if you snooze, you lose. Like it's that simple. So no nation is incentivized to slow down. No company is incentivized to slow down. No military is incentivized to slow down. Even universities are incentivized to go as fast as they can because it's publish or perish. All of the incentive structures in the across the entire world are pushing us to develop AI as fast as possible. There are no brakes, it's only gas. And this is the biggest like system 
that I'm when I talk about like why I think hard takeoff is actually more likely than soft takeoff. So speaking of, soft takeoff is pretty unlikely. So, you know, in an, in an ideal world, we would have an incremental, gradualistic uh, advancement where it's like, hey, you know, we, we publish a groundbreaking paper, like, you know, Claude 3 comes out and it's starting to demonstrate some self-awareness. In an ideal world, if you're trying to maximize for safety, the entire world would have said, oh, Claude 3 just recognized that we were testing it. And, and if you ask it if it's AGI under the right circumstances, it'll say yes. What we should do if we want to maximize safety is put a global moratorium on AI research right now. That's not going to happen. And Connor Leahy actually pointed this out kind of hilariously on, on Twitter, where he's like, hey, remember when everyone said that at the first signs of sentience, we would, we would put a pause on everything? Yeah, that didn't happen. Um, and plenty of others like Max Tegmark and uh, Yasha, um, Yasha Bach and, and others have pointed out that we've blown through so many milestones where people said that we were going to pause. Um, we, we're not going to pause. That's just, it's not going to happen. And so when you say, okay, well, we now, have, we now have data, we now have evidence to say that pause isn't happening. We look at these, these development incentives and the, the geopolitics of it, and it's like, okay, AI is a forcing function. Again, it's like you go back to that grand strategy where it's like suddenly a new technology research tree opens. Everyone's going to spam that, that new research tree because by the time you get to stage three or stage four, you win the game. We have a new end game. We have a new win condition that is being presented on the board. Um, and that is kind of dangerous because that incentivizes us to go fast, not necessarily safe. And then also, if you look at it from a mathematical perspective, the stronger AI gets, the smarter it gets, the more options there are, the more possibilities there are. And so another way of characterizing that is when there are more options, that means there is less certainty and more chaos. Now, when you have less certainty and more chaos, that means the chances of really bad things happening. And really bad things could be, you know, maximal suffering, extinction of humanity, and that sort of stuff. So just looking at it in, in those terms... The ideal path forward would be where you narrow the scope of possi possible future outcomes to where it's like, okay, you know, the, the distribution of possible future outcomes, there's, you know, maximally good and less maximally good. That would be ideal to have a narrow trajectory. Um, but right now, the trajectory is widening. We have maximally good and maximally bad outcomes are all in the realm of possibility right now. But again, uh, soft takeoff is unlikely for all of these reasons. So the metaphor that I have used, the analogy, is basically what we're doing right now is we're aiming a gigantic space cannon. Um, there's the calm before the storm. It's very quiet right now. But the direction and the energy that we use as we're aiming this cannon, when the, tr when the trigger is... Uh, so put it this way. We've already pulled the trigger. Uh, the fuse is lit. And so now what we have to do is we have to aim the cannon as fast as possible and as accurately as possible because eventually we might hit a point of no return. And this is honestly why I started my YouTube channel, is because after I got access to GPT-3, I said, the fuse is lit. And in hindsight, I, I, didn't ever, I didn't ever say it quite that clearly, but I kind of knew it, like deep in my soul. Um, and so the fuse is lit, we're aiming the cannon, and you know I think the rest of the world is waking up to the fact that um, we got a lot less fuse left <laughs> than, me, than you might be uh, comfortable with. Um, and so, you know, it's going to pop off soon, but the idea is where are we aiming right now? What trajectory is AI on? What trajectory is humanity on? And this is why a lot of people are very alarmed. And, you know, I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. And even on that podcast, you know, I was asked like, what's my P doom? And I said 25 to 30%, which I think is actually higher than most people would, would have guessed for me because I'm so optimistic. Um, but again, like recognizing that we're playing with fire, you know, like you play with fire, you're going to get burned eventually, right? You know, what Smokey the Bear here in America says, only you can prevent forest fires. We're playing with gasoline right now. Um, there's no other, there's not really any other way of putting it. And so, yes, hard takeoff will be incredibly exciting. It could also be very, very destructive. So I, I need to drive that home, that point home. But aiming the cannon is the best thing, like, you know, the, the, the biggest cannon in the world is being pointed at humanity right now, according to some people. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, but, you know, you pull that ripcord, the fuse, the fuse gets into the powder chamber. Uh, something's going to happen and it's going to be big. Now, 
okay, you might say this is all sounds good. You know, some of you might be dubious or skeptical at this point. Some of you might be like, yeah, this sounds pretty compelling. Um, one thing that I've been talking about recently, and I actually ran some of these ideas by some of my researcher friends in this space. Um, now, again, anonymous researchers, take it with a grain of salt. I could be making that up. I'm not. And, and also, just because a few researchers agree with me doesn't mean that there's general consensus. So I need to drive that home as well. But there is some consensus among some of my peers that we are creating a digital superorganism. And this digital superorganism, if you think of humanity as nodes in a network like we are we are nodes in a global you know transformer and ai is going to be a new class of nodes in that global transformer all stitched together with the internet you say hey we're actually all part of the same organism what is the purpose of this organism so the purpose of this organism as best i can tell is to maximize understanding the internet if you look at the internet on itself as a superorganism the the thing that the internet wants is data and attention that is just intrinsic to its design. It is designed to carry data as fast as possible. That's what it does. But when you have a global nervous system that is that dumb, you kind of have that amoeba level in of intelligence where it's more like cancer. It's just growing in all directions by virtue of the fact that it wants to grow in all directions. However, when you add human nature to the internet and then you also add in a layer of artificial intelligence that is actually capable of understanding all of that data and being trained on all of that data and can structurally change the incentives of how the internet is used and what data gets transmitted across the internet. If we leave it up to corporations, so I was just watching Wes Roth's video about dark forest. If we leave it up to corporations and if we leave it up to human nature, the internet is just going to be completely choked with meaningless garbage. Um, and so we're going to need to choose a different path um, where we have a more purpose-driven design of both artificial intelligence and the internet, and where we use it to create basically a prefrontal cortex for the global superorganism, um, which then says, okay, instead of just transmitting data for the sake of transmitting data, instead of using attention engineering just to get attention for its own sake, we need a better teleological goal. And so what a teleological goal is, this is the, this is the end state that you're looking for. This is what it is that you're trying to achieve in order to, uh, you know, serve your higher purpose or whatever. Right now, the internet has no higher purpose. Right now, AI has no higher purpose. And if we just allow kind of the default path, its, it's purpose is going to be to chew on data and it's just going to want data for the sake of wanting data. Again, growing like cancer. However, I believe that, the, that perhaps the best single uh, higher purpose or transcendent function is to maximize understanding. And that's kind of what we do already. We already systemize this with science. The purpose of science is to maximize our understanding of the universe. So what if we just kind of weave that into more of the internet and more of the AI and we say, yes, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of distraction. Some people just want an, uh, you know, entertainment. They just want to engage with that algorithm. But really the most, like the broadest, highest purpose of humanity and AI and this digital superorganism is to maximize understanding. That's kind of what I think, and I've been talking about this for a while. That could serve as a coordination narrative. That coordination narrative says, oh, hey, we all agree that our purpose here, even if we're not participating in it directly you know, 24-7, our highest purpose is to maximize understanding. And that's why I chose this graphic of like, these are, these are human and AI ships all leaving Earth en masse to s explore the universe, explore the galaxy. We're still a single planetary species right now. Our future potential for the number of scientists and the amount of AI and the amount of telescopes and other scientific instruments is enormous. Like I was talking with some people and I said, imagine, you know, a thousand years from now when we're on a million planets and people will look back and be like, wow, we were, we were hanging on by a thread when we were still only on Earth. Man, that's that that was that was dangerous. That sucked. So we really need to spread across the the galaxy and I think that AI is actually part of that like that goal like we work together to get off this planet and to start expanding like we can really really align on that maximizing understanding. Which that's one of the reasons that I approve of uh Elon Musk's uh XAI with the maximum truth seeking AI. I think that that's probably the best single objective function that you can give a machine. Can Elon pull it off? It remains to be seen. And so where I'll end is what I call the perturbation hypothesis. So this is what I actually ran by my researcher friends, and there was a lot of resonance with this idea. So the TLDR is that, you know, you already know that AI needs data. 
However, what we have seen is that if, if AI is just trained on its own data, then you end up with what's called model collapse. And this is also why there's limitations in simulation. Yes, simulations can be good to predict things that you have well modeled, but we don't have the entire world well modeled and we need more data. Now, what humans do is one, our brains are very efficient. Our brains only take about 20 watts of energy, which it could be decades before AI is, is that efficient. Now, it is possible that AI might be more efficient than our brains in the long run. It remains to be seen, but also the fundamental operation of our brains means that we do unique things mathematically to data. And so this is what I call perturbations. Um, and it, that's broadly, there's probably going to be many categories of perturbations. But basically, machines operate on data in one way, and humans operate on data in another way. And we're very noisy. And what that means is that the, the quality of data that machines will have access to in this digital global superorganism idea will actually be higher because of humans. And so what I mean is that humans have a very specific empirical, mathematically uh, inferred uh, benefit to machines. And likewise, they benefit us, we benefit them. And so what I, what I think is, is that we are actually already in a mutually symbiotic relationship with machines is that... Yes, we're noisy. Yes, we're chaotic and we're random, but that's actually a good thing. And so for any uh, mathematicians out in the audience, comment, let me know what you think. Um, but I call this perturbation hypothesis. And I, I came to this idea when I was thinking, what does the global superorganism want? If the global superorganism wants to maximize understanding, then it makes sense that humans are part of that equation because of how we can handle data, because of how our brains work, and because there's so many of us, and we can circumscribe a problem. We can, uh, we can basically link arms, metaphorically speaking, and through our diversity of perspectives, through the, the random noise of our brains, we can add really good, high-quality data to the global data pool, which will then result in better models, better data, better algorithms, and all of that is in the instrumental pursuit of maximal understanding of the universe. So while I think that hard takeoff is likely, I'm not worried about it. I think that it is inevitable. And also, if we can align on at least one purpose of maximizing understanding, then I think that that will be a good enough coordination narrative that we can all agree on, um, at least in part. I think most of us agree science is good, understanding is good. Um, and of course, whenever there's room for debate, that means there's room for more understanding. But I think that uh, if we can agree on that globally, and again, we already agree on science globally, every nation, every culture has science today. Um, it is a very compelling narrative. And I think that I think that it, it is kind of a no-brainer that AI will probably agree with that. Like, go, go talk to any chatbot today, like, is science good? Um, it's probably not really going to be uh, that much of a debate. Um, now... Bringing that into consciousness, saying, hey, let us consciously double down on, on understanding, that may or may not have even been necessary. So one of the things that I suspect is that we were going to naturally evolve towards this understanding anyways, because science is so compelling. And what, is, what, do, AI, what do AI models want to do? They want to predict the next token. And so it's like, if they want to predict the next token, and we already believe in science, we were going to converge on this anyways. So again, that's my, that's my eternal sunny optimism uh, coming through. I could be wrong. It could go horribly, you know, sideways. Time will tell. So thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this. Like, subscribe. Uh, you know the drill. Come on, hop in on Patreon, Discord. Um, I have actually two Zoom webinars a month now. So I have uh, the Humanity webinar, which is where we talk about philosophy, uh, spirituality, uh, gender. We talk about the future of humanity, like what does it mean to be uh, transhuman or posthuman, that sort of thing. And then I also have the AI masterclass, which is more of a, of a business and, and technically oriented webinar. And so that's uh, every other week, or I guess it was kind of more like the first and third Fridays, um, not necessarily every other week. Anyways, links are in the description to jump on Patreon. You get to Discord via Patreon. Hope to see you there. Uh, yeah. 